so I guess it's true that God really does use crooked sticks to make straight lines. Good evening, everyone. How are we doing? You doing all right? Give me a wave if you can hear me. Yeah, good. It's fine. I'm it's fine. Guys, happy Easter Sunday. It's so good to be with you. Thank you for giving a little bit of your Easter day to be here. We're already going to be anywhere in the world right now. You're here with us. I'm grateful for that. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm part of the team here. Special welcome to our team and our friends from the United States of America. It's great to have you with us. My wife and I will be the only American in the room, so that's great. Good encouragement to her. Thanks for being here. Um, we just wanted to spend a little bit of time to wrap up our series on fools and failures. We've been working through some famous characters in the Bible who are known for having made a mistake, or they've got a reputation for having done that. We're just unpacking a bit of their story and can we learn from their foolishness and their failure. We're wrapping up today, you may have guessed it, with the character Doubting Thomas. Now, I love that, not this Thomas here, by the way, this, that's a different one. So that's Tom Roderick, he's really good at keyboard and other things. But this is Downton Thomas from John chapter 20 in the Bible. So I'll be referring to this story quite a lot. If you want to read along with me, um, it's John chapter uh, 20. I'm going to be reading uh, from verse 24 onwards. But just before I get to that, how amazing is it, right, that this guy is known with uh, a word attached to his name? So Downton Thomas. I think that's hilarious. I don't know how many friends you have where there is a word associated with them because they do it that much. I think for me it might be like late Matt. Like and there, might, there might be a thing because I'm late so often that just becomes associated with my name. I don't know for you what that would be. That's one of our questions for the Q&A later on. Um, what would that be? I think the only person who could rival Downton Thomas for a funny name that's gone down in history is King Louis of France, known as King Louis the Fat. I think that's the only other name that might like, go down in history as being one of the funniest, like just the guy just ain't really well and he was known for it, I think that's awesome. So, there you go. I quite like to be known for that, because I ate so well that there was a name given to it. Anyway, let's read about Doubting Thomas and see how he learned this name. So this is John chapter 20, verses 24. I'm reading from the uh, NIV, so your version might be a bit different, but here we go. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus. We had a great name in the morning service, clear past this one, that's right there, Didymus. One of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand, and unless I put my finger where the nails were driven in and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet they believe. Wow, what an amazing story. And I wonder if you can relate to this at all. I think there are several parts, and it's a very short story, where I think, yeah, that's a reasonable thing to have said. And what I want to do is unpack this. So, Matt, we've got a couple of images up. So if we can pop the first one up, which I just think is the name. I want to look at two tensions that exist within our daily walk of faith. Two things where I think that these opposite forces seem to be pulling at our hearts. Uh, and I think that they're demonstrated really well here by Thomas. He's such a relatable character. There is more alliteration in this preach than the way to stick out, so I hope you enjoy this. Okay, so the first one is this. Uh, and it is the feeling of faith. So the feeling of faith. And what I mean by this is two things. Agony 
and assurance. And we see both of these forces at work in Thomas's life. And how often in our own lives have we seen these two things happening, right? An agony or a problem of faith, but at the same time, a real assurance and a commitment. As humans, we seem really capable of huge doubt, but also huge faith and real commitment. And we seem able to do both of these things. Look at this in verses 24 and 25. Unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were, put my hand into his side, I will not believe. This is a moment of crisis for Thomas. And it's really interesting that actually I think there were three things that led to this moment of agony in faith for him. And I think that they can be summarized as his personality, his position, and his pain. His personality, we don't read a whole lot about this guy throughout the rest of the Bible, but he was someone who was prone to being negative. This is a, a, a personality trait that we see in him, fatalistic, the worst might happen, and negative. So his personality led him maybe to being someone who just doubts more often. More often than not, I'm going to just question things, and that's actually okay, that is a personality trait, that is a thing, that is a way that someone can be. But notice also that he wasn't there when Jesus first appeared to the disciples. Where was he? Now again, this might just be part of his disposition. Maybe he's an internal processor, he didn't want to be around the crowds, he just needed time alone to think through. This person I said I'm going to die for, he's been crucified. My whole life's been turned upside down. I need to go think about this. So actually he's isolated himself from the group. So maybe that led to it. And then thirdly, the pain. He's just had a major crisis moment in his life. And if this hasn't happened to you yet, at some point it will, where something so dramatic happens that it shakes the very foundations of what you thought life was all about. And it shakes that thing, the thing you were putting your trust in, and you say, oh, I thought God was always going to be good, I thought God would always be there for me. I don't think bad things happen to, to Christians, to people that have faith. And they will. It's one of the few things Jesus promised us would happen is that hard times will come. More so, in fact, if you believe. But this had happened to Thomas. And so this combination of factors, his disposition, his isolation from the group, and a major life event. Man, of course he doubted. Of course he said, well, you know what? Unless I see the nails, I'm, I need proof. I'm, I'm not just going to go out on a limb. I've been hurt before. This major thing has happened in my life. I need proof. I don't think it's unreasonable to be this person. I, I think that we brand him as a fool and as a failure, but I don't think that that's a bad thing in this place to have said, I need proof. I need to see the marks. I need some proof and actually this, this person is who he says he is. I think this is really reasonable for us to ask this question, to behave this way. I want to encourage you this evening, and we do this all the time at the evening service, that you are doubting is okay. That you're asking really big questions is okay. That if you have a problem with God, you can take it to him, he's big enough to listen. If you need to see proof, ask the awkward questions, go searching. Your doubt is okay. But look at how quickly this turns around. Verses 26 and 27. Jesus shows up to them and he says, Thomas, here I am and shows his divinity in that moment by knowing and addressing the exact problem that Thomas had, even though Jesus wasn't in the room and Thomas said the words, Jesus addresses his real need. He says, you wanted proof? Here it is. Here are the two things that you asked for, literally, the, the holes in my hand and in my side. Here I am, here is your proof. Thomas didn't even need to, I, I would never, you know me, I'm super squeamish, I would never put my hands in, no, I just need to see it, that's fine. Seeing it would be more than enough. He didn't even need to do the thing he said. He didn't need to put his finger in. He didn't need to go near the wound. He saw Jesus and in that moment makes the greatest declaration of faith that we have in the Bible. So really, he should be known as faithful to us. Because he said, my Lord and my God. The first person to declare the divinity of Jesus, that exclusively, Jesus did not deny him. My Lord and my God. I want to encourage you tonight that it is possible to be a person of great agony in your faith, but also to be someone who has assurance. That is possible. What's the difference? It's the resurrection. It's this thing that we're celebrating today. It's the physical 
bodily resurrection of Jesus. That stops it from being this myth, right? This thing that we grew up hearing about, this fairy tale story. If a man lived 2,000 years ago and physically, actually was killed and rose again, that changes everything. It's no longer just this story that we can go, oh, maybe it happened, maybe it didn't. If he rose, it changes everything. And for Thomas, it changed everything. For me and for my faith, researching the proofs of the resurrection, did it actually happen? Doing my homework and asking the difficult questions, the result of that work led me to greater faith. In your life, if you ask the hard questions and you persevere, your faith will grow as a result, and I encourage you to do it. So that's the first tension, is the feeling of faith, the agony and the assurance. But there's another tension at work here, so Matt, if we could just put the next one up, and it's the focus of faith. And here we see these two things at work, affirmation and appeal. I'm going to expand on that a bit more. The affirmation of our faith is declaring that Jesus is King. And so our focus of our faith is not on us, but on Him. Jesus is the primary focus of our love, of our adoration. The song, that actually, I think, Brandon, you picked that song, but that was what they wanted to sing. He is worthy of our adoration and praise. He's worthy of the sound that we made in this room this evening. He's worthy of us having a national holiday and so much more to honor his resurrection. In fact, nothing more profound can be said about Jesus than what was said about him in this passage. My Lord and my God. Not my good teacher, not my motivational quote of the day, not the person that I wish I was a bit more like. But all of those things are good. No, not just that. My Lord and my God. God. The affirmation, the focus of our faith is Jesus, and Thomas shows us how to do it. But here's a question for you. Did Thomas have an unfair advantage, right? Some of you might be sitting there thinking, well, sure, Thomas got to see him. He had a huge advantage. We can't be expected. You can't ask me here tonight to make that kind of level of commitment when Thomas clearly outmatched me. How could I possibly make the same declaration? I would actually argue that his advantage was different, but not unfair. We have access to the same stories and historically verifiable accounts of Jesus that Thomas did. So the major things that you saw, uh, that Thomas saw Jesus do, you have access through the Bible to the same accounts. When Thomas watched Jesus turn water into wine, guess what? We have access to that. When Thomas watched Jesus defeat all of the religious leaders in their philosophical arguments, you have access to that. We have access to the same accounts of the life of Jesus that Thomas did. And we too, because I hear your next argument, I hear it, it's fine, that's cool, but, Je- but Thomas had a relationship with Jesus. He actually knew him. Jesus spoke to him. Did you see the video that we watched just now of Bradley where he said that he was reading the Bible and all of a sudden, someone who wasn't with Bradley had the exact same verse given to them to encourage him. In that moment, God, I don't know if you you know this, God was speaking to you, right? Hallelujah, God speaks. (laughs) God was speaking in that moment. There are millions, billions of people across the planet who would say that they have an active and living relationship with Jesus. I would say that that's true for my life, and I know that there are people in this room that would say that actually it's not just a, a, an intellectual thing, it's not just a thing that my parents believe, and I guess I have to. I actually have a daily relationship with Jesus. Man, that is different. That's so different. And if either of those things are true, we have exactly the same access that Thomas did to the person of Jesus. So Jesus is the focus of our faith, but the thing that I want to say to close is this, that this story makes a great appeal. The verses that follow, so I'm just going to read this now uh, from John chapter 20, the verses that follow this story are really important. Listen to this, verse 30 here. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. I wish they were. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that means the chosen one, the one specifically that God had chosen, that Jesus was the Messiah, 
the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. And so although the focus of faith is about Jesus, we cannot help that actually there is an appeal to all of us to react to this. Like I said, if Jesus actually rose, we can't just ignore that. That's not a fact that you can just bury and say, uh, I don't have to deal with that. The, <laughs> the focus, is that the Bible I'm reading to you, that is real time. The focus of our faith is not just Jesus, but it's actually us responding to him. And so in your life, you must react to this news. You have to decide, is it nonsense? Is it just a story? Or actually, is this true and therefore everything changes now? You have to ask that question and you have to find out what you think about it. The word appeal means to make a serious, urgent, or heartfelt request. Now that's exactly what happens here at the end of the book. John, who wrote this story, says, guys, I've written all of this so that you can make a decision. I'm not just writing it because I want to be encouraged. I'm not just writing it because I want to know more about him. I'm writing it so that you can decide for yourself. Many of you in this room would have grown up with the influence of either a parent or a friend, and that might be why you're here today. Jesus doesn't really mind how you got here. He just needs you to decide. We have to individually make an appeal. It's not just good enough that your auntie was once a Christian and went to church. You need to decide for yourself what you make of all this. You need to decide and react and figure out where your faith will go. And so in closing, would you be encouraged this evening and this day as we celebrate Easter? First of all, it's okay to doubt. It's okay to ask a really big question. Secondly, I want you to be encouraged that it's possible to have assurance of faith. That actually you can research the resurrection and you can have assurance and confidence in your faith. And finally, would you be encouraged that Jesus is the focus of our worship, the focus of our faith, the focus of our life? I pray that you would respond to that appeal, that question, who do you say I am? I pray that tonight we would all respond and say, Lord, yeah, I'll follow you. I'm committed to you. Can I pray for us? Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this weekend. We thank you for Easter and the story. Lord, as we reflect on this person, Thomas, um, and the reputation that he has as being a great doubter, Lord, I pray that we would all be encouraged that you can handle our great big questions the same way, Jesus, that you did there in that moment. You didn't, re- you didn't rebuke him. You didn't turn him away. You didn't say, get away from me. You're, you're excluded. Lord, you said your, your doubt and your anxiety, it's all welcome. And so, Lord, we thank you for that encouragement. And we pray that today, We would embrace the mess of our faith, both the agony and the great assurances that we have. And Lord, would we make you the focus of our faith? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.